Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us tonight for Diversibility Unplugged, Disability and Entertainment. Before we dive into our panel, I would like to give everyone some more time to join by describing the image that's on your screen. It is a cream graphic with navy text. At the top is a navy and orange gradient with the words, please keep microphones muted throughout the event. Below the gradient is Navy text that says Diversibility Unplugged, Disability and Entertainment. And that's above four round headshots from left to right, Nick Novecki, him, he, him, actor and founder of the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge, Natalie Travone Gross, she, her, performer, fashion designer and 2022 D30 honoree, Tamika Chichen Spruce, she, her, film producer, screenwriter, and another 2022 D30 honoree, and Rick Daniels, he, him, professional model, dancer, and performance artist. Beneath the pictures to the left is a Navy banner with white font that reads moderator Marie Dagenet Lewis, she, her, operations manager, diversibility, alongside a round picture of her. Right aligned at the bottom are the words Join our online communities, the Diversibility Leadership Collective, HTTPS, uh, colon, backslash, backslash, D-I-V-E-R-S-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y dot M-N dot co. And fun fact, if you join now, you can actually get your first week for free. Centered near the bottom are two logos a Navy Diversibility one, and a Black Interpreter Now logo. Now, without further ado, let's begin. Hello, and thank you again for joining us. My name is Marie Dashnay Lewis, and I am a pale-skinned woman with long black and purple hair, wearing a black shirt, black glasses, and I'm sitting in the corner of her room. I have the honor of being the operations manager here at Diversibility where our entirely disabled team works together to elevate disability pride through community and conversations much like this one. Tonight, we are diving into the world of entertainment. Representation matters. And when we see disability reflected in the world around us through entertainment, it helps us create a sense of belonging and feel like we belong to this world. However, historically, the representation we've seen has been inauthentic and disempowering. A 2021 study has shown only 3.1% of characters in film and television are disabled, and a whopping 95% of those roles are actually filled by non-disabled actors. And that's only one aspect of the entertainment industry. But thanks to some disabled pioneers in the industry, we are witnessing this change in real time. And we are joined by some of those pioneers tonight. We are seeing disabled artists being hired like never before, and they're performing on stages and on runways to the silver screen. And they're helping break out of the stigmatic Hollywood tropes to create authentic, empowering representation. So I wanna get right to introductions and let them tell you a little bit about themselves. Tamika, I would love to start with you, please. If you don't mind giving a brief introduction of yourself, your role in the entertainment world, and starting with your visual description. Yes. Hello, everyone. Get Tamika Sitchin Spruce. Uh, my physical description I'm a, I'm a brown skinned, African American woman. I'm wearing uh, low black hair and have a white t shirt on. Um, you can't really tell, but I got Frida, one of a wonderful disabled artist uh, that inspires me. And uh, we red lipstick, and I'm outside uh, in front of my house. It's a gray background, and you see a little bit of the other houses. Uh, so I am a disability justice activist, also um, independent film producer, screenwriter, also um, a speaker 
And uh, so this really sums up my role. I love to, you know, advocate and, you know, educate and, um, you know, produce uh, film and TV um, for people with disabilities, BIPOC communities, women and girls. I love the multi hyphenateness of your work, if that's even a word, because it's like you're showing that disabled creatives can do everything. They can not only write it, they can produce it, direct it, make it happen. They can promote it, advocate for it. I love it. Um, Rick, I would love to go to you next, if you don't mind giving us your introduction. And um, you might have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry. I just didn't want my dog to interrupt. Um, so my name is Rick Daniels. I'm a 54, soon to be 55 year old Caucasian male. Um, I have short brown hair, hazel eyes. Um, I am um, slightly unshaven and I'm wearing black um, diamond earrings um, and a, um, you can see the top collar of my shirt. It's cream with blue stripes. I'm seated in my um, kitchen area overlooking my living room where there's some photographs or pictures on the wall and a ceiling fan and bits and pieces of a room. Um, I am a model, dancer, and performance artist. Um, I do work full-time for the local county, and I also help my mother-in-law stay in her home. So there's a lot of hyphenations going on there, too. <laughs> um, but as far as entertainment and, you know, that type of work, um, I began as a performance artist and migrated into circus and dance from my first performance art show. People just reached out and I started to deviate and and a woman who a local artist wanted to paint me and um and such. So yeah, I'd love to do some runway work. That would be really great. I think um you can't see in the imagery um in the screen, but um my body is very unique. I'm four foot eleven and I have very um small lower limbs. Um, and my upper body is the opposite of that built and whatnot. So it's a, a unique dichotomy. Um, dichotomy is a word I use to describe my life a lot because I'm I'm disabled and yet uniquely quite able at the same time. Um, so I perform locally. I'm a company member with Omnium Circus, which has been a real honor. So we're touring and and engage with that. But I also dance with um, American Dance Wheels Foundation. I do um, personal projects. Uh, I perform locally with Circovation and thing, uh, projects for the New York State Dance Force. You know, basically I take whatever comes along as a freelance artist and whatever else I can fit. <laughs> I love it. I know this is gonna be a theme amongst all of our panelists is they, are gonna be extremely busy people with so many different aspects of their career that it's so exciting that we get to dive into all of this in a little bit. Um, Natalie, I would love to go to you next. If you don't mind giving us an introduction and your visual description, please. Yeah, so my name is Natalie Travon Gross. I am a brown skin, black woman with black hair that goes a little past my shoulders. I am legally blind, I have blue eyes, and I'm wearing a burnt orange sweater. And uh, what do I do? Okay, so uh, I currently work full time now as the accessibility um, Natalie, I think we might accessibility strategy and events. Um, Natalie, we're kind of losing you a little bit. Can you hear? Can you hear us? Yes. Can I'll go back? Nick, I'm gonna check the okay. internet. 
Okay, great idea. Nick, we will hand it over to you um, if you don't mind giving us your introduction and then we will go back to Natalie. Yes. Hello, I am Nick Novicki. I am a white little person with a little bit of a beard. I got a blue shirt on. Uh, I'm three foot 10, so I get uh, four foot 11. We're kind of in the family together. Uh, you know, four foot 11, three foot 10. You know, it's just we're all in the same club, right? The uh, by did. trade, I'm a, <laughs> by trade, I'm a comedian, um, an actor, and, and producer. And I'm also the founder and director of the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. Uh, it's a five-day filmmaking competition. I started the Disability Film Challenge 10 years ago to help other people with disabilities take their career in their own hands. Uh, it's grown year after year. I partnered with Easter Seals Southern California in 2017. Uh, and so I'm still a working comedian and actor. Uh, you know, Natalie, shout out. Uh, she she won Best Actor two years in a row, which is a transition in case, you know, she is the right time uh, or we go back to her to, at a different time. So I'm used to being, uh, you know, the fill-in guy. I'll be the warm-up comic. If there's a problem, I get out there, go on stage. If the microphone goes out, uh, <laughs> I just, I'll be that. Uh, uh I'm, I'm honored to be here though. So many cool disabled creatives and, you know, I love what, what you guys all do here. Sometimes oh. I just keep talking until I get cut off too. I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, Nick. Natalie, I would love to hand it back over to you if you're all ready. Yes. Can you hear me better now? Yes, perfectly. Okay, great. So again, my name is Natalie Travon Gross. I am a brown skinned, black blind woman, have dark hair that's going a little past my shoulder, blue gray eyes, and I'm wearing a burnt orange sh uh, sweater. And uh, full time, I work as the accessibility strategies and events consultant at Levant Consulting Inc. And um, on the side, I do a lot of things. I am a fashion designer, I'm coming out with my own fashion collection this year that's uh, very tactile because that's how I identify my clothes as a woman, as a blind woman. So I am playing with a lot of textures and fabrics. I'm really excited about that. I also dance with Infinite Flow Dance Company and I do quite a bit of print and commercial work. So I'm just really excited to be here with all of you and talking about entertainment. Thank you. And like Nick and Tiffany just said, you are also the two-time Best Actress winner for the Easter Seals Film Challenge last year and the year before. So we have to give you a shout out with that as well, because that is such a massive part of breaking barriers in the industry is that challenge. And so now let's get into the nitty gritty and start to dive into the conversation with our first question. What made you decide to pursue a career in entertainment? Um, Nick, I want to go to you first, just so you don't feel like the filler. <laughs> you know, I'm, I I like that. Sometimes I like to be in that role. Uh, no, but it's uh, so for me, I've, I've started uh, speaking in front of audiences when I was a little kid. I used to raise money for little people of America. And I would start with a joke. I'd be like, you know, there'd be a podium and I, no one could see me. So I'd kind of make a joke about they didn't have a stool, you know, and I'd do like the invisible man kind of bit. And so I didn't really see it as I was doing stand-up comedy, but really I was doing stand-up comedy. So was, as a kid, I started doing that, got into acting and, uh, you know, I really just fell in love with it. Um, and it kind of became just a part of my identity and, and what I did and the fact that I was doing it at a young age. It was, you know, partially instinctual, just as a little person growing up in the Northeast and you kind of, you know, use comedy to sort of break the ice, but also uh, just a part of my life and something that I just love doing. And I just, I guess I was a ham as a kid, so I like doing it. And, you know, I just kept going until people tell me uh, I got the hook. You got to get me off. <laughs> I like how you said it was instinctual because as you were talking, I was like thinking that it sounds like entertainment was a natural transition for you just in your life, like it was meant to be. So I can't wait to hear the more about how it transitioned from the beginning because you have such an impressive 
resume and just track record and portfolio. So next we'll go to Tamika. How did you know you wanted to start your career in the industry? Yeah, well, very much like Nick that I wanted to, you know, be in the arts theater. About often tells a joke that um, I wanted, I begged her to take me to the audition for Orphan Ants because I wanted to be Andy or what orphans and stuff. So it's like I saw my name and likes, you know, ever since I was, you know, very much younger. But I really wasn't given the opportunity to be in the arts until I went to community college where I got into theater and then, um, then it, you know, went from there. Um, so, yeah, let's see, that's kind of like my journey got so sideways and then went into when I got older. And I, I hate how the arts can be inaccessible at times, especially when you're younger and you're in a wheelchair, you use a mobility device. So I'm glad that to hear that when you were older, you were able to at least be a part of it. And it must be like awesome to know that the work you're doing now does so much more to make it accessible for the younger children like that. Yes. Um, Rick, I would love to go to you next with how, what made you decide to pursue your career in the entertainment world? So like Tamika and Nick, I think we're all gonna have similar stories. Well, um, my mom always used to say that I was either doing gymnastics or dancing in her womb because her stomach would bulge and make all these moves. And, and, um, and then growing up, I also like, you know, because I used a wheelchair, but I also um, played in the street. I grew up in the Bronx and I learned how to jump rope on my hands and play hopscotch on my hands. And I'd sit on a skateboard and, and, and propel myself with my hands. And, and so the way I adapted in life was kind of like, um, interesting, like not only the way I looked, but the way I engaged. So inevitably people, people, you become kind of a spectacle, but not in a negative way, you know, and I, at a very early age, I recognized that, um, you know, there was a lot of empowerment there where I could like, I knew people were looking at me out of genuine curiosity. And, um, and if you don't mind, I'll share a very brief story. My mom, one time I was walking with my mom, I call it walking, even though I use a chair, uh, but I was walking with my mom and I saw a woman looking at me and our eyes connected. And I turned to my mom and I said, why do people look at me the way they do? And she said, well, you know, you're different. And for a second, I thought she missed the nuance of the question because it wasn't the fact that they were looking. It was the, the anxiety and the pity and the you know, that, that whatever they were experiencing, they were experiencing in their eyes, I could see it. And it felt repulsive, not that I was repulsive, but it felt like they needed to distance themselves. So it was painful for a child. But a few seconds later, my mom was amazing. And if I talk too much, I'll cry. But, um, but she said, you know, I believe God creates each of us unique and beautiful for a purpose and loves us just as we are. Consider the flowers in a field. They come in all shapes, sizes, all colors and designs. They all serve really important purposes, yet many of them are still considered weeds. And for it really hit home and I recognized that while in their eyes I needed to be fixed or eradicated or somehow not be what I was, I was whole and perfect just the way I was. So, so I think performing has just been a natural way, whether I started doing gymnastics, it really wasn't performance, but every time I went on a pommel horse, every time I competed, I was essentially performing because people are viewing and the response was always very positive and, um, and inspirational. You know, so I think I'm I'm fulfilling God's purpose for my life. So that's really what drove me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that beautiful story because it really is true. It's like you see all these wildflowers everywhere, especially where I live in Appalachia. There's so many wildflowers and it hurts my soul to think of how many people look at them as weeds. But, you know, they exist and it's like 
I never really realized how empowering it is to have people watch you perform and watch you for your talent, for your skill, until I heard you speak about that. Like you gave me goosebumps just sharing. So thank you so much, Rick. Um, Natalie, I would love to go with you with this next question of how did you know you wanted to start your career in the entertainment world? I feel like the odd one out because I it's just so opposite from everyone else. I actually was born with 2020 vision. And although like as a kid, I like loved to dance all the time. Like I would literally like be the first one on the dance floor. And um, my parents would say that like, they would have contests where they were like, okay, we're gonna give people money. Whoever, you know, dances the best. Like we're gonna give people money. And they were like, you would kill it every single time. But like, for me, that was like fun family stuff. Like I never thought that I could grow up to be um, a performer. Like I didn't know, like I never considered that as a career. And then when I went to school, I just assumed that I was gonna be a publicist. Either I was debating between fashion and um, sports, but quickly saw that there were no blind publicists and people were not open to hiring a blind publicist. And it really just started to change the way I moved within my life. Like I decided from there on, like, hey, I need to advocate for not only myself, but for people that don't have opportunities. And so for me, I was like, well, I need to better understand my community. I didn't have a lot of blind peers at this point or really knew a lot of folks with disabilities because none of my family members or friends had disabilities. And I was like, I need to be surrounded by people that I can learn from and that I can take direction from and who understands the things that I'm going through. So I actually saw a posting for a blind theater group. And I was like, oh, this might be fun. They were looking for someone who could sing. And I grew up in church choirs and sung in competitive show as a kid and like a bunch of choirs. I was like, oh, I could just maybe do this. And I ended up joining and uh, found out that I was actually really good at it and ended up getting scouted and got an agent. So that was, I kind of fell into the entertainment industry. I absolutely love how different your story is though, because I was like, I was like, excited for you when you just said you found your agent my heart was like broken for you when you couldn't find a career as a blind publicist because I know how heartbreaking it is to have that passion the skill the talent and then to see that the ableist society isn't as accepting as we were told it was it's so heartbreaking but I'm so glad to see to like know that this is your career because i like you are such an important part of the community. I've known you for a few years and I've always considered you an important part of the community. So it's awesome to hear your backstory and just where it all began. Um, our next question is, what does disability representation mean to you all as people who are actually creating that representation? Like, again, I wanna start with you, Nick, because I actually remember seeing you on an episode of Boardwalk Empire when I was a kid. You were probably one of the first times I've ever seen a disabled person on television. My parents were watching it and it was just so, it, I remember that to this day. I don't have good memory. But so I would love to start with you as someone who has been creating that representation for years now. What does that mean to you? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, second of all, I'm starting to feel old when you're like, I watched that when I was a kid. I was like, man, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, just kidding. The, uh, but the, you know, it was, that was a dream, you know, to be able to be on that show uh, and to be able to work with Martin Scorsese, uh, who was really my idol growing up, you know, as a filmmaker. Um, you know, I got to work on, you know, with him. And I, it was actually because I had already worked with those producers on the Sopranos. Um, and so they remembered me, uh, but even getting that opportunity, that was through kind of having my own demo reel or where I could be, you know, roles that weren't specific to me being a little person. 
And so that's how I was able to get my agent. That's how I was able to get, uh, you know, opportunities. That's that's how I got in the room. That's how I got in the door. Um, and so, you know, really having those kind of opportunities, I know uh, those are opportunities that a lot of people with disabilities haven't gotten the chance, you know, and there's just so much talent out there. And I think what I noticed was it's a lot of times was so many people that were great and they were funny, they're, they could be dramatic, they're great writers, they're great actors, they're great directors, but they needed that opportunity to showcase themselves. And I'm very passionate in authentic representation and to people with disabilities telling our own stories and putting ourselves in our own position to win, you know, so that's really become, you know, I mean, as I said, I, you know, I, I'm a comedian at heart. I always consider myself a comedian first because that's what I've been doing really since I was a kid. And so a lot of times I, I try to find ways to tell things through comedy. Uh, but, you know, I never would have thought, honestly, when I started my career as a comedian and actor, how much of my life would be de dedicated to disability representation. And honestly, when I started the film challenge 10 years ago, I was like, this will be a fun one-off to help disabled friends make films and make projects. And here we are 10 years later, and it's like a major portion of my life and something I'm very proud of. And I'm just proud to be a part of such a cool uh, disability community that I think really I consider like family, you know, anywhere we go, I'm like, hey, I know this person. I know this. I go to a city and, you, you know, we know each other. It really is awesome because I know so many people who have competed in the Easter Seals Film Challenge. That's one thing that really connects the disability community, whether you participate in it, you watch it, you have friends that participate in it. It's something that always comes around the beginning of the year and it's always something we can rely on that does create that authentic representation. You're right. It's when disabled people are able to control their own narratives, whether it's a vocal type of thing, whether it's your dance performance, when they're able to control their narrative, such beautiful art happens and that creates the authentic representation. Um, Natalie, I would love to go to you with this next with this question next because you're someone that never expected to be that representation. And here you are as someone who has won multiple awards, who has walked down runways, who has their own brand. So what does it mean to you to be part of that disability representation? Uh, <laughs> I sometimes I'm still like shocked or, or surprised about like the things that I'm doing because anything that I do ever since I became blind, I always had the mission to like give back to my community or to be a voice. Um, and I try to align myself with projects that do that that uplift the community and kind of go against those stereotypes and misconceptions about us. And so the work that I try to align myself with is always going to go beyond what people expected. I mean, a lot of people were surprised to know that I was part of an all-blind runway show and they're like, how is that possible? But we can literally do anything. It's about having access to things and having the opportunity. And so for me, representation is about highlighting what it, what it takes for us to be able to participate, right? Like what are the access needs? How do we get to those points? Why is it important? Um, we're super dope. We're stylish, we're sexy, we're cute. We uh, like to do the same things as anybody else. And so I really try to focus on showing the human side of us and that, yes, we have disabilities, but that's just one part of our personality and identities. We're these complex, brilliant creatures that need to be seen. And so that's how I kind of look at representation. How do I put that at the forefront? How do I elevate that? How do I get as many eyes on that as possible? Because I think that's what's gonna really push the mission forward for inclusive representation. I love all of that. Like, I can't wait to pull a quote from that later. And what I really want to echo and amplify before we move to the next person is we can literally do anything. It's all about access because it really is all about the accessibility of 
whatever it is, whether it's a job, whether it's a hobby, whether it's like a friendship even, it's like we can do anything as long as there's accessibility, as long as there's empathy, compassion, and understanding of different human needs, because it's not special needs, it's human needs. Every, like all of us are human. And so it's like, as long as there's that understanding, then there's so much beautiful possibilities that can happen. And so I love that. Um, Rick, I would love to go to you next with the same question of how does it feel to be that disability representation and what does it mean to you? So um, as a member of Omnium Circus, it's amazing to like be on stage. And what's wonderful is there's, um, there's a diverse group of people performing with me. So um, I'm not just representing people with disabilities. And to me, that's always been a reality. You know, growing up, um, my family, we never really referred to me as disabled. And I really don't perceive myself as disabled. Um, I have a very unique body that comes with a variety of unique of abilities. And, um, but so for me, uh, representation not only means dispelling the myths, stereotypes and stigmatizations, you know, and creating, but it's creating opportunity, not just for people with disabilities, but, you know, for all people to see what's possible, you know, for themselves and not just in the entertainment industry, like the entertainment industry is a wonderful platform because it is broadly viewed you know, whether it's even a smaller venue, but because of audience aspect, you know, um, but the reality is, you know, um, it's really about inspiring people. That's part of it, you know, for me and all people, because I think um, I used to, sometimes when people would say, oh, I saw you get out of your car, you're amazing. And I'd be like, that's ridiculous, you know, but at the same time, a mentor of mine helped me realize that, you know, um, that we take things for granted. All of us do, even those of us with disabilities, we know what we can do. And you know what I mean? And we've internalized our abilities and we know our abilities. And so when we live our lives, you know, beyond those expectations and beyond, um, you know, and we navigate the world uniquely as we do, um, you know, it's, it's empowering. It's empowering for everyone around us as much as it is for us. So for me, that's what representation means. It means just um, moving the whole world forward. You know, um, I do feel it's gotten a little better, but that gets into another question. <laughs> I, I love how you say that entertainment is really like the platform that helps communicate all possibilities and it shows all possibilities because it really does because it it's a way to communicate in a way people can be receptive to because when they're seeing something when their mind is open to something that's when there can be real education and real growth and real learning because all of the possibilities are aligned um Tamika I would love to go to you with how does it feel to um I don't remember if I've already asked you this question, so I'm going to ask it to you again, just in case I did it. I'm so sorry. I just had such a brain fog moment. But what does disability representation mean to you as someone creating that representation, like with your films and with being on the D30 list? How, what does that all mean to you? Yeah, um, so representation is everything to me. It is one of the main things that drives me and fuel me um, in this, you know, world of, you know, of film and, and everything. Um, and it, it is mainly because going up, um, which I didn't mention earlier, but I have a spinal cord injury mm -hmm. that I acquired as um, a baby. And so I grew up with, you know, having a physical disability and using the wheelchair. And then on top of that, being physically disabled, I, you know, growing up, I was one of the only Black girls, you know, with a physical disability. Like, in fact, much of my schooling, I was only Black 
you know, the physical disability being mainstream. I had the whole entire school. So, you know, that that just that representate that representation wasn't there for me, you know, to to see myself. And this was during the 90s, you know, and see, you know, what the possibilities were. And I didn't really see well, anyone who looked like me until I got to uh, 21, actually. And so, you know, creating the representation. Um, so that, you know, um, girls with disabilities, in this case, Black girls with disabilities can see themselves and see the possibilities and, and of what they can be and what they can do. And um, so actually one of the first documentaries I produced was called My Girl's Story. And so, you know, because I thought about you know, my teenage years and then um, have younger siblings sisters, you know, in Generation Z. And so that's how I came up with uh, creating a documentary that features Black girls and um, in Detroit and what they have to go through. And I was very intentional to have one of the girls have spider bifida. So you got to see in the film what it was like, you know, growing up in Detroit, being a, a Black girl with a disability. And so the hardest disability, you really could tell so you had the invisible aspect of it. And so when I did screenings, community screenings, and one of my mentees said, oh my goodness, I finally see myself on screen. I feel seen and I feel heard. And so that's like, yes, that's what I want. And even, you know, women without disabilities said that they were able to relate to the girls' stories and they feel seen and heard too. So it's just representation, you know, um, fuels me even the uh, projects I'm working on now and just hearing the women and hearing the people's stories who's going to be involved in the documentary and um, reality show. It's like, oh, I gotta get this on screen. Or two, just, you know, yeah, our stories matter and it needs to be heard. Mm -hmm. See, I really agree with you. And I love that you were out there making these stories, making sure that there's this representation, making sure that not only is it there, it's it's something that kind of like you kind of live, other people kind of live because they feel themselves, they feel seen. And that is the most beautiful thing when someone feel seen by your work like I don't think there's any other better feeling than that um our next question that that was kind of like a high note and so now we're going to kind of go a little darker because we're going to talk about some of the obstacles in the industry we can't have a conversation about the entertainment industry without talking about how some of it's not good and there needs to be some changes so um I will start with you Nick what are some obstacles that you've experienced throughout your career? Well, I, I guess I'll start on uh, just where I'm at. And I think where I think the disability community is at, you know, and, and just say I'm very optimistic the the growth and the changes. Mind you, I've been, you know, an actor and a comedian for over 20 years. So I've seen quite a difference from when I started uh, the, just, there was no auditions if, you know, unless it was very specific to your disability. And I know now we've seen, I mean, that was the reason why I created the disability film challenge to help other people, you know, be able to, to tell their own story. And I'm seeing more and more of that happen. Um, but I think this is not just for people with disabilities, you know, in the arts in general, it is a really hard field to break into. If you want to be an actor if you want to be a producer, if you want to be a comedian, uh, you're entering into a very challenging field. And, you know, it's it ends up becoming how much can you do on your own? You know, I think the challenge is sometimes, you know, people have different skill sets. And so uh, you learn how to uh, do uh, multiple trades and multiple wear multiple hats and Maybe you need to also learn how to write instead of just act, or maybe you need to learn how to uh, produce as well, or maybe, you know, all these other fields and there's opportunity in all those uh, fields. And I think uh, 
Uh, the challenge is honestly people getting in the door because I think the talent is there. Uh, and I'm very honored that people have through the film challenge gotten those opportunities. But I think just in general, the industry is is calling for it. Uh, it's not easy and I'd be lying and anybody's going to be li lying to just say everybody's waiting for you and they're going to hand out <laughs> these kind of careers. You have to really want it and love it and and have to also be OK with not getting jobs because it is, uh, you know, being in the business for over 20 years. Uh, I've been lucky. I've been in over, you know, 40 TV shows and movies, worked with Oscar winners. But I've also not gotten so many jobs. And I've also, you know, had my heart broken <laughs> so many times where I was like, this is my dream. And and it just didn't work out, you know, and that's that's part of the the business. And I think uh, the challenge ends up being, you know, still that, you know, uh, historically people with disabilities haven't gotten the amount of auditions as people that don't have disabilities or the amount of uh, job interviews or auditions. I think that's changing, but I still think there's uh, growth opportunities and opportunities for further exposure uh, for the community and and just in general for for us to be seen uh, and and for us to shine. Definitely, I agree because it's great that there's progress. We all love progress. We can never expect perfection over progress, but at the same time, there's still so much farther progress that needs to be done. Um, Rick, I will go to you with this question. What are some obstacles that you have faced throughout your career? And your mic is muted. <laughs> Sorry, my bird was tweeting. I have pets, no, <laughs> my dog and my bird. Anyway, um, so I've kind of, the way I live my life is kind of like floating down a river. You know, I take opportunities when they arise. I kind of bump off a rock here and there. So like I've never, I didn't set out to be in the entertainment industry. But I think what Nick said about, you know, whether it's the entertainment industry or not, you know what I mean? It's always, it's always going to be challenging to, you're always going to have uh, uh, disappointments, you know, and things. Um, I do think it's improving. Like I participated in a casting society of America um, nationwide casting call. And that was really cool. And I'm not an actor. So, but I was like, I'm still going to do this because, you know, I, so what I did was a performance art piece, you know, a very short, succinct performance art piece. And I've gotten contacted, but one of the other obstacles that I face is, um, and again, it has nothing to do with disability. It's my work-life balance. And it's the fact that um, that I never wanted to really chase every gig. You know, um, I always need a job, like a, a base, you know, for like to pay the bills. I need stability, you know? And now it's ironic because now I'm, I'm middle-aged. I'm going to be 55 in five days. And uh, Omnium Circus is touring and I'm... You know, and I'm I'm in a place where I'm not vested in the county, but I just had a conversation with my boss about like, what does it mean if I take unpaid leave? And, you know, because I want to do, I want to take the opportunity because it's the biggest opportunity I've had for the, the greatest audience. And America's Got Talent reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to audition. And I, I'm debating on that too, because, you know, you hear mixed things about the narrative and how the, that's managed, not just by AGT, but in general in the industry, you know, and if they want to, want to, you know, craft it because it's still a, a program, you know, it's a manufactured program. Um, if they want to craft it in a certain way, you don't always have control over that. So that's a, a concern of mine, you know, um, so I'm not, I didn't say yay or nay, but really the time management piece, you know, and again, that has, it's nothing to do with the industry. It's a personal choice of like, how do I balance, you know, two careers right now? And how do I prioritize, um, you know, my long-term goals of having a pension and like making sure that I'm set and my husband and I are like, okay, in our lives, you know, or, and I'm blessed because my husband is always like, well, you're not getting any younger and, you know, and he's always really encouraging me, but I'm a realist and I also, it's hard. It's so that's what I'm facing. That's the main obstacle I'm facing right now 
is probably fear, you know, and, and not, not knowing what direction to take. So I've talked to my boss and I, I even said in the email, I'm like, let's set up a meeting because maybe your input will help me, you know, make this difficult decision, you know? So, so that's really the biggest obstacle. I personally have all, I haven't really tried to promote in that regard, I've taken opportunities locally. And then eventually I kind of started, you know, doing other things, um, other opportunities as they arose, you know, um, through American Dance Wheels Foundation and just, you know, and, and in that regard, I traveled. Um, I was at a concert for Michael Fronte and Spearhead. And then he reached out to me and put me in one of his music videos. So I'm kind of an opportunist and I'm not like trying so in that regard, I don't run into obstacles. So, you know, I'm, I might not be the best person to speak about the obstacles of it. I think you're a great person to speak about the obstacles, though, because I think those are obstacles that we all experience, disability or not, time management, having, wanting, not knowing where we want to go in our careers yet. Like all of the possibilities can be overwhelming at times, you know? And those are some real life things that go along with any career. So I'm really glad that you shared those. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Um, Tamika, I would love to go to you next with this. Um, what, were, what are some obstacles that you faced so far in your career? Yeah. So as I shared before, I always wanted to be involved in the arts. Um, you know, ask my parents, my parents, my parents, you know, take me to, you know, to, uh, you know, get the 90s to like the auditions and probably searches and things like that. That had occurred in a cry. Um, had my mom at 15, uh, she got a professional Molly cop, uh, pictures of me taking and things like that out the chair and so I was at a Bali agency at 15 and she looked at my pictures and it's just just a face and she said you got you have a great look but because you in a wheelchair you have a disability you will not be able to model so I suggest that you take classes for your self-esteem that's what she told me. And so that like crushed my Bali, you know, uh, dreams, you know, and things like that. And that hurt me a lot. And so, and then fast forward, when I, after I graduated from high school, I wanted to go to this broadcasting school for radio and television. And the same thing happened there. They called the whole meeting and said, essentially told me, how could I attend their school? And so I was an activist at that time. Um, and I was like 18, so I didn't know any better. So, uh, you know, I went to a community college, but the, the blessing came out of that is that's where I met the theater director, Jerry Desplowski, uh, who, you know, blesses our, he, you know, passed, has since passed away, but he saw, you know, my talent as a writer and, uh, you know, chose me to write a one act, was selected by one act play to be staged at the theater. So I directed it, you know, I did uh, stage work and things like that. And I did some radio at the time at the radio station, which was tons of fun. And then I did later on graduate with a bachelor's degree in journalism. And so video production and things like that. So, you know, there were, of course, like challenges and discrimination. And, but, you know, I'm the type of person, the more you tell me no, the more I'm like, I'm going to show you. And so I'm like, you know, skip you, but do it anyway. And so, you know, I, I did it. And um, I just as a filmmaker, grassroots, independent, any filmmaking. You know, that's anything under five million. And so, or, you know, start off in your career, that's the type of stuff that you go to, you know, with no budget and things like that. So I had my run is with some people, you know, that wasn't on the up and up, but, but that's just how it is as a uh, filmmaker or film producer that you're going to run into, you know, people who don't have your 
best interest in heart. So, you know, definitely I recommend, you know, knowing the business side of film and TV or entertainment. So people don't try to take advantage of you because they will try you. So, you know, but you just have to go out and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's like the sad reality is like knowing they're going to try to take advantage of you before you even go and knowing that chances are they're going to destroy your self-esteem. Like that just blows my mind that they destroyed your self-esteem and then told you to go take some classes for it. <laughs> um, and just for anyone listening, if you have any questions, we will be having a Q&A portion towards the end of the conversation for all of our audience questions. So please put them in the chat with a little Q and we will get to those in just a little while. We have a few more questions before we get to there. And Natalie, um, you are off cam, but I'm still gonna ask you the same question of what are some, oh, there you are, hi. <laughs> of what are some obstacles that you have experienced in the industry? Yeah, I think Marie, you can probably agree with this one is that sometimes it just comes down to the narrative that they try to put out in media about us. So even like sometimes you'll get a script and it's like very tropish and stereotypical and in complete transparency, like that's a lot of what I've been getting as far as TV and film. And so I've kind of taken a step back and doing more print and commercial work because I actually get to play different characters. Uh, when I do stuff like that, I just did a print job where I just got to be a woman on a date. And I was just on a picnic, toasting champagne, learning how to fly a kite. Like my disability wasn't a factor. And I think, and I would love to see more of that. And I, so I would say that's the biggest obstacle for me. Just, I'm just tired of the helpless, hopeless, we can't do anything, we need to be saved type of storylines that are put out there. And so that's what I love about you know, taking the step back and working on fashion, because that was a really always been a, a passion of mine. I get to create the narrative around the types of clothing that I put out and the messaging and the promotion around it and just um, showing who I am as a woman who happens to be blind. And that's what brings me a lot of joy, being able to have that control over, you know, what the story is going to be and being able to really just show um, who I am. Like I've been <laughs> telling people, like I just really feel like I'm in my grown woman era and anything that I do, I want that to reflect that. And so, yeah, I think for me, yeah, it's just been kind of the narratives that are put out there. Like, yes, there's been a little bit of change, but I still feel like there's a lot of work that needs to be done when it comes to storytelling. Oh yes, you are speaking to my soul, Natalie. Because seriously, it's like with storytelling, I feel like it's so sad that disabled people are pigeonholed into disability. It's like, not that there's anything wrong with disability, but we are so much more than disability. It's like the multifaceted of life. Like, I love that you got to be on a date and you got to like drink champagne. Like, that's how it should be. Like, it's, we should be teachers and doctors and journalists and like all of like the roles that aren't tied to disability. Disability is just a part of it because the person just also happens to be disabled. I feel like that's what we're meaning when we say authentic representation. Like we don't mean it has to be disability. We're just saying like, we wanted to reflect disabled lives. So whatever disabled lives are, which are extremely multifaceted, and are not a monolith whatsoever, that's what we wanna see. Um, and so our next question is, because this is kind of like leading towards that, of how can the industry be more accommodating and more accessible to disabled creatives? Um, what are some ways that you all think could help improve that? Um, Nick, we'll start with you. <laughs> Uh, well, first off, I love that you're out there drinking champagne. You're on a date. I love that. You know, <laughs> uh, it it is though. It's like that's that's really the to me. I feel like true inclusion 
ends up being where we don't even have to talk about me being three foot 10 or anything else. It's just, we're just in that narrative. Now we're on a date, uh, even though I'm happily married, maybe I end up in this commercial on the date with Natalie, you know, I don't know who knows. That's I'm, I'm putting out there in the world. So somebody, uh, I want a pension credit. Uh, that's what you get in SAG <laughs> anyways, inside baseball. Uh, no, I think, uh, what, what can be done more? It's, it's about amplifying each other. Um, it's about, um, you know, helping get each other's work out there. Uh, it's about me retweeting and sharing Natalie and her awesome, you know, uh, like runway show where everybody's blind and it's just, they're just, she's just an awesome fashion designer. And that's what it is. The end of the day, it's about the art and letting, letting the art speak for itself and letting us kind of, uh, be shown for what we do and, and, and get those opportunities. So I think what can we do more? It's it's part of it is also sharing with each other. Um, and I think the media could do a better job of sharing stories that are just cool stories and uplifting without. Uh, I do think that there is a bit of a trend in the media where we tend to only be shared in negative stories where it's like, ah, this person is playing somebody who's not disabled. And, and that comes up all the time. And I understand it's something that we're all passionate about. But, you know, when we can be spotlighted more uh, in mainstream media, that helps uh, kind of uh, give us sort of a, an edge for it and gives us credibility. So uh, I think whenever we can do that, and really, I think that's what diversibility to me, I feel like is a big takeaway, is that's really what it seems like it does for the whole disability community and, and what this call really is doing. Um, you know, and I, I want to check out this dance, man. I want to, I want to see in that, you know, I'd love to go see the circus, you know, and, uh, and all those things, you know, and so it's like, it's supporting each other. You know, I think at the end of the day, what more can we do? Um, just, just be supportive. That is the best answer ever, because honestly, it's like, being supportive doesn't take much. You don't have to spend anything to reshare a post to comments more than five words on somebody's post so your, com your comment doesn't get flagged as spam. It's like, you just never know how much that helps creatives get seen. And also it's like, it kind of shows other people how they can be supportive too. It's like, you're kind of leading the way and showing the way by doing it. And I, I love being able to be a part of a community that it's like, we try to amplify and we try to support one another and create as many possibilities and as many opportunities because there really aren't that many opportunities out there and we have to just create them for ourselves. I feel like that's what so many of us do. Um, Tamika, I would love to go to the next question, this question for you. Um, what are some ways, what that you think the industry can be more accommodating and accessible to disabled creatives? Yeah, I definitely will say what Nick, what Nick has said. And it also, you know, as a film producer, uh, you know, have these ideas. But if you don't have funding, you know, or different pipeline opportunities to get your work seen by executives and, you know, mentorship opportunities that, you know, um, that could be a little bit of challenging. And there's, you know, there's different, um, different opportunities. Like Nick said, uh, there's others. I'm actually a part of a great program called Unlock Her Potential. And they um, have a side, well, they have mentors in the industry, entertainment industry, different industries to mentor women of color and help them go to the next level. And so um, I was selected to be part of that. And my mentor is a W. Camille Bale. And so just having, you know, those different opportunities to get access, you know, to people who are already in the industry and uh, give funding to projects. Uh, I think seeing more of that, then it would be definitely helpful as a field producer. 
Definitely. Thank you so much. And mentorship is really important. And mentorship too, it, you don't have to do a lot for mentorship. You can just have, have a connection with somebody, spend some time speaking to them and giving them advice. That's like the most common way I try to be a mentor is because I don't have a lot of time, but I can talk to people for a couple minutes, give them some advice, tell them what I think. And that helps people so much more than you think, because even just like brainstorming with somebody or knowing that somebody cares enough to that you want that you cares enough that you succeed. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> um, Rick, I'd love to go. To you. Oh, yeah, of course. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add on one thing uh, to what you said, too, for mentorships, um, because I've been blessed that I've had a lot of people that have kind of mentored me and I've fallen into that position and also witnessed it a lot. One thing is a piece of advice is if you get an opportunity to meet with somebody that may be able to mentor you or or help you out, try to be as prepared as you can for that moment. And, you know, whether it's having your portfolio ready, um, some of these things that I think sometimes um, if you do research on who you're meeting with, where did they go to school? Where are they from? Little things. Sometimes you can connect to people Um in a way that's that's much easier because uh, some people, if it's you know you're getting a meeting with a high level executive, I mean it's, it's, those are meetings that are really hard to get and they're not always going to happen you know very often. So you know doing is being re ready for that meeting as as you can is I've seen people get a lot you know um, to, yeah, advantage. Mm -hmm. That is great advice for so many things: sponsorships, yeah. collaborations, partnerships to just do a little bit of research and to try to connect on a deeper level of just being there, presenting yourself. I think that's such great advice. So thank you, Nick, for, for that. Um, Rick, we'll go to you with the question before we get yeah. to our audience questions. Um, how can the industry be more accommodating and accessible to disabled creatives? So in my notes, I indicated what has been said a lot, which was authentic representation. And I'm like, you know, the reality is, and I loved what Natalie said in terms of having the opportunity to just simply be a human being as we are, you know, on my website, um, I have a quote that I wrote um, for a presentation I did at Sloan Kettering. And it says, one day we will live in a world where we view and consider each other equitably for the human beings we are beyond the human bodies we happen to inhabit. And, you know, I think it goes beyond disability. You know, it's the color of our skin. It's, you know, it's our socioeconomics. And so I think uh, the industry could be more accommodating, you know, by simply um, opening up in terms of how they see human beings and actors and, you know, and, and people that are going for jobs, um, for their talent and for, you know, what they can bring as the individual they are and not necessarily the, the role they had crafted in their mind, you know, like to be a little more open to, you know, uh, having a new dimension. Cause sometimes a program could be so much more enhanced if the character became more dimensional and more interesting and more. So, I mean, there's opportunity for the, the producers if they were simply more open-minded, you know? So I think, you know, it would be beneficial, very symbiotic if we just simply allowed people to be authentically ourselves. So yeah. that's the primary thing I think they could do, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it kind of sounds like it should be easy to allow people to be authentically themselves. Yeah. Kind of I mean, I me. mentioned having a husband. <laughs> and so, like, how many, for years, all the gay characters were not even gay, you know? And, and you know, so I represent a lot of dynamic, a lot of, di you know, um, demographics is the word I was looking for, you know? And so personally, you know, representation, if you get back to that, for me, seeing people that were like myself, you know, and in all of these facets, you know, um, whether it's disability, whether it's orientation, you know, um, it's really important, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I feel like the industry, you know, 
could just be more relaxed and less controlling. I know they, they haven't, they could be, and you know, and just try, even if they don't ultimately like, you know, an audition, they should at least be open to giving people opportunity, you know, and maybe seeing things from a different vantage point, which is what people with disabilities, you know, often afford. Mm -hmm. So true. Like so much can come from an open mind, mm -hmm. so much amazing innovation, beautiful art, beautiful creations, as long as there's that open mind. And the one of the most important things about um, representation is that it's intersectional. I love hearing all of the different intersections that all of you guys have named, not just being disabled, you know? That's what's so important too when we're talking about representation is that it's intersectional representation. We're not, we're not like one, one-sided people. There's so many different sides to everybody. Um, Natalie, I would love to hear from you on how you think the entertainment industry can be more accessible and accommodating towards disabled creatives. Yeah, I think I would love the industry to uh, understand access needs as a mainstream concept. And so I feel like a lot of times when we talk about accommodations or accessibility, people assume that it's extra or they have to do like some <laughs> extravagant thing or, but like, we don't say that if one is lactose intolerant, for example, right? That's an access need. If we give them some almond milk, is that a big deal? No, it's an access need. And so I would really just like for them to take a minute to say, hey, like these are things that every, like everyone need, has needs. Like we're not, we're not calling somebody needing almond milk special needs, right? It's just something that we easily found a way to accommodate them with. And I think that's the same thing when it comes to disability. There's always workarounds. There's always ways to do something. They may look different, but it doesn't mean it can't be done. And I think if the industry understood it in that way, I think it would, you know, be so innovative and push a lot of things forward for the disability community. It really would, and not just for the disability community too, for the community at large, because accessibility, the part of universal design is that everybody can benefit from accessibility, even if they don't realize that they could, if they're not understanding that that's what they're doing, everyone's lives can be made easier with accessibility. And I do agree that like, I hate that access, access needs are being viewed as special treatment. Like if somebody accommodates somebody, then they're getting a special privilege. When no, it's just an access need and that is a medical necessity. So I really agree to that. If the industry can start viewing the access needs as the essential parts that they are. And I feel like if they hire disabled consultants, they'll get there quicker. So let's hope they do. <laughs> um, it's a matter got... of norm normalization. Mm -hmm. So if access needs became a normalized part of the process, instead of something that has to be introduced or interjected or brought or advocated for, then it simply would exist. And they would ask themselves at the beginning of every film shoot, okay, are there any people with special, with needs? You know, I was going to say special needs because it's the, it's the colloquialism, but you know, do we have any particular, you know, and then they could simply, the more those got utilized, they would simply have access to those tools and they wouldn't be so cumbersome or problematic or complicated as you know they can be perceived because they would become normalized so you are so right like even going down to like something so small as normalizing image descriptions and making it a habit to use image descriptions it's like when that's a small example of somebody doing an access thing that you don't have to be a corporation. You don't have to be an, an employer. It's like once you add that to your routine, it becomes normal. Like 
before I used the image descriptions, I don't even, I just posted stuff, but now it's like in my routine that I can't post something without it having that image description. And it wasn't really cumbersome because I like, I, I hate the fact that people think of access news as cumbersome at times, because it's like, imagine living in a world that's not accessible to you. That's cumbersome. <laughs> and I really wish that people, you know, the people making the decisions about the access needs would start to think of that process instead of thinking that it's inconvenient for them to go out of their way to make somebody else's life easier. Well, they deserve that. People deserve those access needs. Um, and so now moving towards our audience questions, because we do have a few audience questions. And if you have a question, please, by all means, put it in the chat and put a cue in front of it just so we can see it. Um, our first question is, I love the message that, no, oops, sorry, like, <laughs> I love the message that none of this happens overnight. I'm curious as to what keeps you motivated to keep going in this industry when you might be getting more rejections than wins. Um, so Rick, your mic is unmuted. So I'm going to go with you first. Okay, great. Um, well, you didn't ask the question of what advice do you have to anyone um, uh, that wants to have a future in the entertainment industry? And so that's a perfect segue into that. And so one of the things my advice is every little project, you know, like I didn't set out to be touring, you know, I really was just doing I was entertaining myself. I was engaging in theatrics. I was performing, you know, for my own entertainment and inspiration, inspiring other people and all of that. It took a while for me to embrace that because the word inspirational has all of its, you know, um, pitfalls for people with disabilities, you know, the super crip and all of that. But one thing that happened for me is, you know, I just kept, doing my little things, you know, and every, so the advice I would give is, you know, to climb a mountain, it still takes one step at a time. Like you still have to, you don't just jump to the top of the mountain. So at the end of the day, it really is just realizing that each of your projects, each of your opportunities are significant. And you may not know how they're significant now or when they're going to play out in your life, you know, but um, but they build on one another and you learn and you grow and you you navigate. And at some point, all of a sudden you get a call or all of a sudden you you get an opportunity and all of that foundation serves you. So that's my advice or that's how that's what keeps me going is because I didn't really have a dream. I was like, yeah, it'd be, it was always like someday it'd be nice too. But I never, I wasn't pursuing it. And then all of a sudden it manifested. And it was because I was generating one little bit at a time, you know? I, I love that reminder of uh, it takes one little bit at a time. You just got to keep making that foundation one step at a time, one brick at a time. Because for me, I know personally, I get lost in the bigger picture. And I get overwhelmed by all of the things that I want to accomplish that I still haven't accomplished. And it's like, if I would just remember to take it one brick at a time, I would see all of the stuff I've already accomplished. And I wouldn't feel so down on myself at times because when you're looking towards the stuff you still have yet to do, you don't see what you've already done. So I really appreciate that advice. Like that's some great like sage wisdom to me. So thank you. Rick for sharing that. Um, Natalie, I would love to go to you next. And you are right. That's a really good combination of this audience question. And one of our last questions of what advice do you have? So like, how do you keep moving in this industry with projections? What advice do you have? Choose joy is my advice. It's a daily struggle and it's something that you have to choose daily. But what keeps me going is finding things that bring me joy and finding things to laugh about, uh, finding love, spending time with those around me that I really treasure um, and surrounding myself with positive people that are always encouraging. I have 
some of the greatest friends and they've been such a support system. Like you'll see them show up with me to different events. Um, my friend Lindsay was with me at the Disability Film Challenge Awards last week. Uh, her and my her and my friend Regina flew with me to New York to walk in the runway show. So it's just choosing joy, and the way I choose that is is to is to surround myself with with love and and positive vibes, and just keeping the energy always at a high level. And then when I'm not feeling my best, like I also feel that I allow myself to feel that because like sometimes you do have to let things hurt and so I'm not saying to like just act like things are all good but you know you let yourself feel that hurt and then you say okay what can I do to to get past this like what are some things that make me smile or make me happy or what what's and I think those are some of the just keep in mind I love that you acknowledge your feelings and when like, you know, there's so much toxic positivity to say, oh, just choose joy, like just focus on the positive. But I love that you acknowledge that like when you're feeling down, like it's okay to feel down and acknowledge those feelings and then choose joy again. And I, I think that's really important because when we deny ourselves those negative feelings, we just don't know how they're going to bubble up and how that could impact us in the long run. But when we process and allow ourselves to feel the rejections, then, you know, we, we grow from that all. And then we get to choose joy and feel better after that. So I love how beautiful that is. Um, we have about, we have a little less than 15 minutes left. So I'm gonna run to one of our next questions. Um, this one is for, um, this is for Natalie again. Um, do you ever, have people look at you or treat you differently doing due to you having acquired a disability versus having it be congenital? And do you have any struggles with being part of both worlds and knowing both sides? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> great question. I think, you know, whether you become disabled from birth or after, I think people are always going to, there's always going to be those people that treat you awkwardly or weird or just you know like as if you can't do certain things I think like sometimes it shows up a little bit in my family I was just talking about a training that I did this morning um I went home to visit my parents not too long ago and my nana was struggling with groceries and I was like hey can I help you and she's like well you can't help me and I <laughs> it was out of a place of like stereotype and misconception in her age it wasn't said to hurt me um but one thing that we teach is that language can either give or take power away and in that moment I felt a little bit of my power being taken away even though I know I can help her bring groceries in I taught IL for other blind students and so I definitely know how to go into the grocery store and load groceries in and out of houses and cars and stuff but I think that you're always going to have a bit of that and I think you have to look inside yourself and, and know what you can do and and then educate like I had to like have a moment of not just getting angry but being like actually I can help you <laughs> let me show you how and so I think that you know but I wouldn't say that that just happens because I you know because I went blind I think those things happen you know whoever I talk to with a who is bl blind or low vision people are always going to have they're always going to fill away um but I always say to people like guess what I was blind yesterday I'm going to be blind today and tomorrow so I'm always going to show up unapologetically blind and you know you'll deal you know like that's just the reality of it all and I think once I took that attitude about things like yes things that people say can be you know I can you, you know kind of taken aback but I think I'm always moving forward. Um, a mentor of mine's always said that leaders always look forward, they don't look back. And so mm -hmm. I think you just take some of those things with a grain of salt and know that like you are power, you are strength. I think the disability community is like the epitome of strength and power. And so I try to remember that when people say little things like that. Um, what was the second part of the, <laughs> the question? Marie, I'm so sorry. 
you were totally fine. The second part is, do you have any struggles with being part of multiple worlds and knowing both sides? You know, actually, I, I think of it as a blessing that I've been able to experience both sides because I feel like, you know, as a disabled woman now, I have a lot more compassion for people. I have a lot more grace. Um, it's made me a better person. And so I can see kind of both sides and I, I know how to meet people where they are and how to address certain issues because I, I was there like on the other side. Um, and so I think like, I don't have an issue with that. I think it's been such a, a, such a great thing for me to be able to be objective and to be able to, you know, meet people with love and show them that I do understand, but also correct them with love, you know, sometimes <laughs> you do have to correct people and, and that's okay. Like, but understanding that it's coming from a place of lack of education and, and, and internalized ableism, which we know Marie, you know, a lot about, I love your videos on it. And so I think um, it, it's been really helpful for me. I don't think it's been a struggle or a challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Natalie. And you are such a vibe. I could listen to you talk all day long about everything because you have such a calming presence. And I just love like everything you say. So thank you for that. We have probably time for one more question before we start getting wrapped up and we do our final thoughts. So we have a question for Nick. Um, what are your thoughts on Peter Dinklage and Game of Thrones depictions of congenital and acquired disabilities? Uh, Peter Dinklage, I mean, he's a rock star, you know, I think yeah, he's an unbelievable actor and uh, Game of Thrones, I mean, such a multi-layered, you know, depiction of a character to just you know, I think it's it goes so much beyond the story of a little person. And, you know, it's just such a complicated character and about family and dynamics and power. Um, so I, I I thought it was awesome, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of him. Um, you know, I haven't really got a chance to, to meet him. I, I talked to him once on the phone, <laughs> but uh, I'm just a huge fan of him as an artist and, and as a person. Um, I, I want to real quick jump into the, you know, uh, question before um, about rejection, you know, and just say that anybody who's listening, you know, it is going to be a part of the journey of you as, as somebody in the entertainment industry. So I loved what Natalie uh, said, too, and, and being OK with accepting it. Because, you know, it's if you hide it, you know, it, it's like I've been on both sides of the camera as a producer, um, as well as an actor and in front of the camera. And, you know, I, I know that sometimes it has nothing to do with you or you don't get parts, but it can make you so upset and sad. And you're like, man, I blew it. I, you know, I didn't do a good enough job. Or I, I could have worked harder and all these things. And sometimes it has nothing to do with you. And you got to just kind of own it and accept it and it's hard and be be sad for a day but but also to to have that support and the people around you to you know and just to believe in yourself and 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 I think that that's very important to have family have friends I have a French bulldog and that dog's always there no matter what <laughs> so same with my wife and same with you know the, the disability family too I I think we're we're blessed to have like people that you know are there for each other mm hmm and support system makes all the difference. And so I think that really is so important to lean on people and to feel your feelings and know that no matter what, there's always going to be another chance and there's always going to be another opportunity. There's always going to be another person that wants to hire you. So never get down on that. Um, we have just five more minutes left. So I want to give everybody a minute so they can just share where we can follow you, how we can support you and just celebrate yourselves. So Tamika, we will start with you. Where can we find you and how can we support you? Yeah, so you can uh, find me at uh, Tamika Sitches News on that com and also on LinkedIn and uh, Facebook. And also just real quick wanna say as producer and creator, to never take no for an answer. 
you know, because you will get a lot of those. I've got those or people brush me off or whatever the case may be. It's like, oh, it is what it is. And just keep on moving. So never take a no for an answer, especially when you believe in the story and the passion of Gloria. So, yes, thank you for the opportunity. I love that. That's great advice. Never take no, especially when you know you're right and when you know your thing is good. <laughs> um, Rick, how can we support you? Where can we find you and how can we celebrate you? Um, well, thank you. First of all, this is a great opportunity. This is a, a wonderful opportunity for to be celebrated and acknowledged. Um, so my website is rickdanielsperformer.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook, but I don't post a whole lot in my Facebook page. Um, I'm also on the omniumcircus.org website, along with all of the other wonderful characters and um, artists that are on there. Um, so you can follow us on there and support our tour. That would be really, really cool um, because you know it's a groundbreaking opportunity for people with disabilities to be equally showcased um, and, you know, performing and equitably, you know, paid and, and given equal opportunity. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so come to our shows. Um, and other than that, just do your own thing. If you want to help support me, the best way to support, you know, others is really just by living your own life fully and authentically and you know that we all affect the world either positively or negatively and so when we you know choose positivity and love as natalie said and when we engage in the world you know with our authentic selves then we're inevitably not only promoting ourselves we are inspiring others to to do the same so so mm -hmm. that's how you'll support me by loving I love yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's so beautiful. Thank you, Rick. Natalie, where can we find you and how can we support you and celebrate you? Yeah, I mean, I'm Natalie Trevon on literally everything. So Facebook, TikTok, uh, LinkedIn, it's going to be Natalie Trevon on everything. Um, how you can support me. Honestly, I just want to leave you guys with Please like to remind myself and that's just all faith no fear and a really good friend of mine once told me that anything that I'm ever scared of I should run straight towards <laughs> because that's <laughs> get over that fear and that's how I've cho chose to live my life like anything that seems too big or too wild or crazy or too big I just run straight towards it because it actually ends up not being as big as I thought I just had to get over um my own uh, insecurities about it and just do it mm -hmm. I love that I think that is great advice for everyone listening and everyone who's going to be watching so thank you so much Natalie and real quick Nick we have one minute left where can we find you and how can we support you Hey, you could find me at Nick Novicki. Uh, it's Nick and I see no K and then Novicki. I got to make things difficult. Uh, <laughs> no, so you could find me on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and also at Disability Film Challenge, uh, which you could find from my channels. And you can follow me. Uh, I post things about shows, about projects I'm in. Uh, so just follow and support and uh, I retweet and, you know, a lot of other things. So just support the the talented disability community. That's that's how you could support me. That's the best note to end on. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you. And we'll see you next month. Thank see you, ya. everyone. <laughs>